Well, uh, when I started writing these, by the way, I'll be giving all this on the blackboard and just uh, putting figures up here. Um, when I started writing these lectures, I thought this job would have been a whole lot easier 50 years ago to talk about early universe cosmology because then uh, there would be not so much to talk about. Big Bang, then Big Bang <coughs> nucleosynthesis, and a few interesting epochs, matter, radiation, equality, uh, recombination, structure formation. But now there's so much more to talk about uh, because uh, we know there wasn't really a Big Bang. Uh, and there was uh, instead inflation. And before that, quantum gravity uh, things, who knows. And uh, now we have a whole list of um, Particle, particle physics cosmology topics to think about when we talk about uh, early universe cosmology. And uh, there's just not enough time to talk about all those in five days. So I'm just going to focus on inflation, uh, on um, baryogenesis, and on dark matter. And even then, it's a quite tall order. So I'll have to uh, compress a lot. My goal is to try and give you some physical intuition and some references and uh, give you the big picture and show you where you can go for uh, more information if you want to go deeper. And uh, so obviously I'll be leaving a lot of things out. Um, if at any point you feel I'm going too fast and it, it seems like, wait a minute, this just doesn't make sense, could you back up? Uh, just uh, please let me know and I'll be happy to, uh, to fill in anything that seemed to go too fast. Um, let me start with just a few uh, preliminaries. Uh, first of all, units. Uh, we'll be using natural units uh, for the particle physics and uh, for Planck's, uh, for a Newton's constant, I'm going to write something that might be a little different. Uh, so this is the unreduced Planck's constant, big MP, 1.22 times 10 to the 19 GeV. Uh, or you can write it in terms of the reduced, uh, sorry, 8 pi G. So, or you can write 8 pi G is 1 over uh, the reduced M Planck, so that's just whatever over uh, square root of 8 pi. And uh, sometimes when you read papers, people use Planck's constant without telling you which one they're using. I'm always going to, I think I'll always be using uh, reduced Planck's constant in these lectures. And furthermore, some people like to use capital M for reduced and little m for the, the big Planck's, uh, Planck mass. Uh, and uh, I'm going to use this. And I was hoping we don't have to say too much about uh, basics of Friedman, Robertson, Walker cosmology. Uh, so I'm hoping that you all had some general relativity course where you talked about uh, the uh, FRW metric uh, with the scale factor. And I don't know if this is the right metric signature or the wrong one, but the one I'm using is uh, this, the mostly minus one. Um, and uh, then notions like I mentioned redshift. Uh, is that, uh, D cubed x, is that a different notation? Ah, like uh, yes, I'm glad you asked. So uh, this is just the, the metric for three-dimensional space, which could be either flat or, or curved. OK. Uh, I guess normally it would like, is it like dx squared, dy squared, d squared. Like, oh, no, no, you're right. You're right. That, that's totally wrong. <laughs> Why did I? No, 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 you're totally right. It's, 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 thank you. Typo in my notes. And I suppose you might have noticed that my handwritten notes are, are on, linked on the uh, wiki page. Um, yeah, and uh, definition of redshift is uh, 
basically one over the scale fa the scale factor today divided by uh, the scale factor at uh, an earlier time. Um, and well, I guess it's worth mentioning the Friedman equation. Uh, so h squared, which Hubble parameter, that's a dot over a squared, is equal to, uh, so in terms of this Planck mass, 3 over reduce Planck mass squared, minus a curvature parameter over a squared. And sometimes we'll want to think of a as being a dimensionless number, uh, other times as something with dimensions of um, of length, uh, so I'll try to be clear about uh, when we want to do what. Um, and, and I'll assume you know things like temperature, redshifts like 1 over A, and, uh, and that the energy density of matter goes like 1 over A cubed, and the energy density of radiation goes like 1 over A to the fourth. Um, so we don't have to, oh, and things like uh, the scale factor goes as t to the one half during radiation domination and t to the two thirds during uh, matter domination. Oh, and of course as uh, an exponential, uh, well let's just call it e to the h t during uh, vacuum energy domination, which will be important to us uh, in this first lecture uh, which is about inflation. Did I say that? We're talking about inflation uh, in this lecture. And uh, I hope that we'll be able to maybe finish inflation sometime during next lecture and actually get on to, uh, to baryogenesis uh, tomorrow so that we'll have enough time to give a uh, fair time to dark matter at the end. Um, so, yeah, things would have been simple in 1950, but uh, already back in 1979, uh, shortly before I was a graduate student, things were starting to get interesting because an awareness was developing within uh, the physics community that the standard Big Bang pictured uh, had problems. And so probably you've heard of uh, these problems as well. Actually, did I lose one of my boards here? No, there's still... But uh, let's see. We won't cover we won't cover that yet. I don't know what's the best way to uh, use these boards. But going back to 1970. Oh, uh, before I do that, let me just mention one other thing. Uh, what would be some useful references if you want to uh, do some reading? And I know it's very dated. But I still like Colbin Turner, Early Universe. And uh, some things in there are obsolete, but a lot of the information is, is still quite uh, useful. And then there was a, a book, a more recent uh, book by Little and Life on, uh, I forget the title now, but it was about basically about CMB uh, physics. And you can. Uh, you can either find their textbook or there is a, a similar uh, pedagogical review on the archive. Yes? Can you tell us what's out of Well, how about over uh, drinks tonight? <laughs> um, and let's see. Oh, another thing that I like is uh, the particle data group. They have lots of nice reviews. And these are guaranteed to be not out of date because they're uh, updated every uh, year or two. And uh, so let's now let's just talk a little bit of history. So back in 1979, uh, people were starting to be aware, or an awareness was growing of the problems of uh, Big Bang cosmology. And so first one is the uh, horizon problem, which is that uh, at some point along that timeline, uh, there was recombination 
of uh, neutral of uh, protons and electrons into neutral hydrogen. Before that time, of course, photons were bouncing off the charged particles, scattering, not streaming free, freely, but after recombination uh, at that redshift of, uh, I think it was uh, 3,000 or so, um, that's when the universe became neutral and photons could start stream, streaming freely toward us observers. And so we're seeing the cosmic microwave background photons we're seeing are coming from the surface of last scattering uh, at that distance uh, corresponding to how far light could travel uh, since the time of rec recombination. And of course the light that we see from the CMB is extremely uniform, uh, just uh, tiny temperature fluctuations of order uh, part in 10 to the fourth. And yet, if you think about it uh, from the, the causal point of view, and you ask, uh, how big was a region that was in causal contact with itself at the time of uh, recombination, you can calculate that it was much smaller, uh, as illustrated by these uh, little circles. And uh, so these regions of, uh, that were in causal contact, we would expect them to be highly uniform in temperature, but not uh, between two of them. And so we should, we expect to see order one fluctuations in the temperature, or at least much bigger than part in 10 to the fourth, uh, when we look out at the CMB, and yet it's extremely uniform. And to quantify that problem, you'd like to actually calculate, well, how big are these regions compared to uh, the, uh, the large circle? And so for that, uh, one would like to introduce the concept of a particle horizon. And that's just how far could light travel uh, by a certain time in the history of the universe. So you know that light follows a trajectory such that its, uh, its uh, line element uh, vanishes. It's a null, uh, it's a, uh, a null distance in, in 4D space. So it's following a trajectory such that dt is uh, a dx. And then you can, uh, so remember this x is a co-moving uh, co coordinate. The actual distance is blowing up with the expansion of the universe. Uh, if two observers are at a given separation in x, their actual distance is blowing up by a factor of a. And so the actual distance traveled by a photon uh, in a given time is a times the, uh, the distance it travels in uh, co-moving space, which we calculate from here by integrating. So it's a times the integral uh, dt over a. And then you can plug in how a behaves during uh, matter or radiation domination to see that that is uh, 2t in a radiation dominated period or three times the age of the universe uh, during, um, during matter domination. Okay, so then what you'd like to do is just uh, calculate the size. Of, so the size of the little circle, uh, the size of the little circle is the horizon distance at the time of reco recombination. Uh, and uh, the size of the, the big circle is the horizon uh, distance at, uh, at the present time. So that's the, the small circle. Th this is the large circle. That's how big it is today, but of course, in this picture that we're, we're drawing, we want to take it back to how big it would have been at the time of recombination. And so we have to divide by the amount of expansion. So that's the redshift at the time of recombination. That's the size of the, the big circle. So now we're comparing, uh, now we're comparing two length scales uh, at, the same, at the same time. Uh, so 
you just take the ratio of those two things and uh, you find that uh, the uh, you find that uh, basically the uh, the big circle over the the little one is a factor of a hundred and then you can just do a simple calculation to figure out, well, what's the angular size uh, of those little regions? And it's about 3.5 degrees. I don't want to waste too much time on the exact algebra. But uh, so you, if you then uh, convert that two-dimensional picture to three-dimensional, you see there's something like 10 to the fifth of those little regions that uh, should be filling up our observable universe and making it look very inhomogeneous. Uh, so that was the horizon problem. The other problem was uh, the flatness problem. And that relates to this curvature term in the uh, uh, curvature term in the uh, Friedman equation. So let's see. Here's, here's the Friedman equation. Oh, and let me, let me just remind you how we rewrite this equation in terms of uh, fractional energy density of, uh, of the universe. And so if I rearrange the Friedman equation by uh, multiplying by uh, 3m Planck squared, and I'll evaluate it today, that tells me the energy density today minus uh, something that must have here let me call the let me call the scale factor r naught here because now I want to think of it as being an actual physical distance so that's the physical size of uh, the uh, current current universe as we, we see it out to the surface of last scattering. And clearly, this is something that also has uh, units of energy density. And now, if we divide both sides by, if I, de if I define this side to be something called the critical density, Sorry, R, yes? R0 has not energy. It's just, you're just changing A0. Uh, yeah, A naught is the same as R naught. I'm calling it R naught here to emphasize that it, now I'm thinking of it as a distance scale. Yes? When you say size of the current universe, do you mean like the, uh, we're still, it, the scale factor is not the actual size of the observable universe, because that's something you have to, that's complicated to measure, isn't it? The act, exact, because then you need to know the expansion history of the universe to know exactly the exact size of the observable universe. Um, well, basically, it's the size that we call uh, 3,000 uh, megaparsecs, uh, which is... Uh, the scale factor distance thing? Um, the measure of the, the size of the scale factor? Or are we actually talking about the... It's, it, it's basically the, uh, the horizon distance uh, today. Yeah. Yes? Uh, and then, and then K would have to have dimensions. So, uh, so that's our curvy absorbing Yeah. So now I'm going to think of uh, K as being dimensionless. And uh, yeah. So now, if we divide both sides by all sides by the critical density, then we have an equation that tells us that one is equal to the sum. And if we call these ratios omega, so then we have uh, an equation that says 1 is equal to the sum uh, of all the omegas where the I stands for matter or, uh, or radiation or uh, vacuum energy. And we can define this thing to be, uh, with the minus sign, we can define this thing to be an analogous uh, curvature energy density. 
And uh, so I, I just want to mention that because the experimental limit on this curvature density today, it's, uh, it's very small. It has to be less than about 0.015 uh, in, in magnitude. Um, so now if you think about, uh, oh, and so now we can plug this limit back into here. And, uh, oh, I'm sorry. Um, no, uh, take back, I take back what I said about R0. R0 is a distance, and we're, we're going to figure out how big it is here. Okay. Yeah, so R0 is just telling you about the, the physical curvature. Uh, and, uh, and so if I plug into this limit, then I find out that R0 actually has to be bigger uh, than the uh, horizon, current horizon distance by a factor of 10. Uh, okay, so, the, and that's like 10 to the 27 meters or 30,000 megaparsecs. So, uh, the universe is extremely flat today. But, now, if you think about uh, running the clock backwards and uh, figuring out, okay, what, what does that correspond to then at the, the Planck time, say? Uh, well, then it just goes, uh, it scales with the scale factor. So at the Planck time, uh, we would say that the curvature of the universe is just equal to uh, um, the curvature today, the curvature radius today, scaled by uh, how much the scale factor has changed. And so that's uh, going like uh, the temperature today divided by the Planck temperature or the, the Planck mass. And so if we just plug in the numbers there, uh, we find that this is an energy scale of th 3 times 10 to the minus 3 electron volts in the denominator. Uh, whereas the natural choice, if you go back to the Planck time, everything should, you should be at the Planck temperature, the Planck energy density, uh, and the natural expectation is that it would be uh, of order 1 over m Planck. And you see there's a big discrepancy there. It's saying that in order to explain the current universe, you would have had to tune the curvature at the Planck time to a, uh, a small value, uh, much smaller than its natural value, uh, by a factor of uh, 10 to the minus 31. And so, how do you explain such special uh, initial conditions of the early universe? Why should it be so flat uh, at early times? Well, uh, around the same time, particle physicists were excited about grand unified theories. And uh, everybody was thinking about guts. And you may know that uh, one of the predictions of grand unified theories are magnetic monopoles, which are super heavy particles. And there was a paper by uh, Klopov and Zeldovich where they tried to compute the, uh, the relic density of these monopoles, and they found there would be way too many of them. They would overclose the universe. Uh, the universe would be way too dense compared to what we observe. And then John Preskill, uh, he corrected their calculation because they didn't do it quite right. Around that uh, time, Alan Guth uh, was interested in the monopole problem. He was, he was thinking about ways to try and get rid of the monopoles. Uh, and he wrote a paper with Henry Tai uh, where they proposed one way to do it. But then uh, he moved to, uh, to Slack and he, st he was uh, doing his postdoc there, ninth year of postdocing, when he came up with another idea and that was inflation. So that was his original motivation for inflation, but he quickly realized that not only did it get rid of the monopoles by just 
inflating them away, diluting them, but it solved these two problems uh, at the same time. So let me just sketch what the uh, picture was of inflation in his original paper. So he was thinking about this SU5 grand unified theory. And just like in the standard model where the Higgs boson breaks SU2 symmetry uh, down uh, in, in guts, you have a, some scalar field that's going to get a BEV and break the, uh, the grand unified symmetry. And so you have a picture of the, well, now I'm, I'm wasting my efforts here. You have a picture of a uh, potential which at very early times, because of finite temperature corrections that we'll talk about, it was just a parabola. It was symmetric uh, around the, um, having a minimum at the origin. But as the temperature goes down, then the finite temperature effects go away and you start to see what the potential is going to look like at low temperatures. And at some point you develop this, this bump that allows for uh, tunneling of the field. Before the field tunnels, the universe is stuck in this uh, false minimum that has a lot of uh, vacuum energy. And this vacuum energy causes uh, exponential expansion, so inflation. And then inflation is ended by the tunneling of the field, uh, which then uh, forms bubbles of the, the true vacuum. And these bubbles uh, are supposed to eventually fill up uh, the universe. Well, already in uh, Goose's original paper, he realized there was a problem with this because even though you get lots of inflation from uh, this early period of expansion, uh, the end result, these bubbles, turn out to be empty uh, universes. And, uh, and there are other problems. Uh, they turn out to be uh, highly negatively curved universes. People didn't even realize it, apparently, at the time. Uh, but uh, so, uh, unfortunately, you don't get, you don't solve, you don't solve the problems uh, that we just mentioned in this final stage. This was called old inflation. But it didn't take people very long to figure out how to uh, solve that problem. Oh, and incidentally, uh, so during this stage, uh, we solved the Friedman equation to find that the rate of expansion is, uh, is going like this. So that was old inflation, but what people quickly realized was that if the potential isn't too steep once the thing tunnels out, then you can actually still get inflation uh, during this part of the evolution because the field can roll slowly enough so that that approximation, uh, or well, that equation is still a decent approximation. Uh, and, then, and then it works. So, uh, so now I'd like to give an outline of inflation. I have a question going yeah. back to the horizon problem. So you mentioned that uh, you have something like 10 to the 5 small circles fitting in one big circle. Yeah. Is that connected to the fact that you know you observe uh, anisotropies in the temperature of power spectrum of 1 and 10 to 5? No, that's, that number is just a coincidence. Yeah. Yes? You mentioned that the relative Oh, uh, oh, absolute zero. Are you asking what determines absolute zero, or? In other words, my question is that the, the V zero is the relative vacuum energy between the most vacuum and the rear vacuum. Yes. But that doesn't necessarily mean that is the vacuum energy which goes into the uh, I'm assuming that uh, what's left over here is very small. That's the cosmological constant problem, 
which uh, nobody knows how to solve. Okay, so I'd like to give you a, a brief description of how this part works, which is known as uh, slow roll inflation. And so we want the potential to be, in some sense, not too steep in order for this to work. Uh, in that picture, it doesn't look like it's very flat, but you'll see that uh, the picture can be deceiving. So in order to quantify uh, this, we introduce these slow roll parameters. Uh, which measure the flatness of the potential in Planck units, the relative uh, flatness of the potential. So one thing you could consider is just the first derivative. And so this uh, is V prime over V squared. And to make it dimensionless, one multiplies by uh, Planck mass squared. And another one that's important, the same order of derivatives is just the second derivative, and this is defined as m Planck squared uh, v double prime over, over v. Uh, now, these are called the potential slow roll parameters. And nowadays, people who do inflation for a living may prefer to use something called the Hubble uh, slow roll parameters, which are defined to be a series starting with epsilon 1 is minus h dot over h squared, so the time derivative of the Hubble parameter. That turns out to be the same, approximately the same, as uh, the potential slow world parameter epsilon. And then to generate the higher ones, they just take derivatives of the the preceding ones, so epsilon 2 is epsilon 1 dot over h epsilon 1 to make it dimensionless. That turns out to be 4 epsilon minus 2 eta, and uh, epsilon 3 would be epsilon 2 dot over uh, h epsilon 2, etc. So if you read a paper uh, by the Planck collaboration, they're going to be talking about these parameters, but uh, I'm old-fashioned, so uh, I grew up with uh, the potential parameters. Now, well, how do these relate to the motion of the scalar field? So the scalar field equation of motion, well, in flat space, it would just be the Klein-Gordon equation. Uh, but in curved space, in Friedman, Roberts, and Walker universe, we have uh, the square root of g, and uh, so that's a cubed. And then we have g mu nu, that's the inverse of g, so that's a to the minus 2 uh, phi dot squared in the Lagrangian. And uh, I'm going to I'm going to forget about spatial inhomogeneities. So then we just have the uh, potential, and so when you vary that Lagrangian uh, with respect to the fields, in addition to the usual Klein-Gordon uh, kinetic term phi double dot, uh, you get from the scale factor business you get a Hubble damping term. So that's three h phi dot is equal to minus uh, v prime of phi. And again, this is ignoring uh, spatial gradients of phi. So what happens in slow roll if inflation is that uh, the Hubble parameter is so large that uh, this field is or uh, this term is negligible. And then we can just solve uh, a simpler a uh, slow roll equation. And we'll see that that approximation is valid as long as these slow roll parameters are uh, less than one. 
So this is valid if uh, epsilon and eta are, well, say much less than, than one. You can't see, eh? Okay, I'll try to avoid that. That one I cannot lift up. And uh, so during that time, the field is evolving slowly, and the Hubble parameter is uh, also evolving slowly. Uh, the Hubble parameter, it's getting very little uh, of its contribution from the energy density uh, from the kinet kinetic motion of the field. It's mostly potential motion. Uh, and, uh, and so you can integrate the Friedman equation to get that uh, the, uh, the scale factor is going as uh, e to the h integral of h dt. And we define this integral to be uh, something that we call n, the number of e foldings. So uh, that's the picture. That's how you evolve things during inflation. And then eventually, uh, as you come down the potential, uh, you're going to come to a point when one of the slow roll parameters gets big. So when epsilon or eta is of order one, then we can no longer uh, ignore the phi double dot term. In, in fact, the hierarchy reverses. Then we can ignore the Hubble damping, and we can just solve uh, the usual Klein-Gordon equation. So then phi double dot is equal to minus V prime of phi. And usually, at this point, uh, it's just a, a harmonic oscillator. And so we just have a, a field which is, is oscillating. And that kind of field, uh, that kind of configuration looks like cold dark matter in terms of its uh, equation of state. Um, so uh, that's the end of inflation. And what has to happen is that through these oscillations, somehow uh, these os the energy in these oscillations has to turn into radiation. So, for instance, if this particle, the inflaton, is coupled to standard model fields, then the oscillation of the inflaton is going to uh, produce, well, well, the, the inflaton will just decay into those particles. So, um, that's the simplest thing. So, so the inflaton decay causes uh, reheating of the universe. And there's a very simple way to uh, estimate how hot uh, the universe will become. That's the reheating temperature, TRH. There's a very simple estimate you can make by comparing that to, uh, or by, uh, by knowing the decay rate of the inflaton. Because you can just say that, uh, Reheating occurs at a time which is equal to 1 over the decay rate of the inflaton. And it's also equal to uh, 1 over the, the Hubble rate, because that's the age of the universe. And so just by equating these, these, these things, since the, uh, sorry, uh, yeah, so the Hubble rate is of order uh, square root of energy density over the Planck mass. So that's of order m, pl m Planck over the temperature squared uh, at reheating. 
And so now you can just uh, solve this and, find, and estimate that the reheating temperature is of order uh, square root of M Planck and the, uh, the decay rate of the inflaton. So that's a little bit uh, surprising result because you might think it should depend on uh, the height of the potential because after all we started off inflation with all of this energy V naught and somehow that should tell us how much energy is available for reheating. And well that, uh, that intuition is not entirely wrong uh, it's correct if the decay rate is sufficiently short, uh, but if the decay rate is uh, if the if the decay rate is slow, uh, then a lot of the energy that's produced in these decays just gets redshifted away uh, before uh, reheating is is uh, finished. And incidentally, I put some uh, exercises on the, the website. So one of the exercises on inflation is uh, precisely about that, uh, that question and showing you how, uh, how it's possible for V naught to divide out of the final answer. Anyway, this is valid uh, only if uh, the reheat temperature is less than, that you calculate is less than the total available uh, uh, what you would have expected is the total available energy. So now that's what inf how inflation occurs. Let's just see how it solves the uh, problems. And so one thing that's obvious is that uh, the flatness problem gets solved just by the stretching of the, uh, this, uh, just by the expansion of the universe. Because any uh, initial uh, curvature is just going to get uh, diluted by the expansion by a factor of uh, e to the minus uh, 2n. So that tells us how much inflation do we think we need in order to solve this 10 to the minus 31 uh, tuning problem. So to get uh, a factor of 10 to the 31 in, or minus 31 in the curvature, you can just solve this and find that you need n of order 7, 70 E foldings. And uh, well, that turns out to be a little bit of an overestimate because uh, in, pr in practice, if you look at the, the Friedman equation during inflation, in including, uh, suppose we had a positively curved universe and if we included the curvature term in the Friedman equation, you would see that uh, the initial curvature radius of the universe could not be too large or you couldn't get inflation started because this curvature energy would be dominating over the uh, potential energy. So that means that actually the initial curvature couldn't have been 1 over M Planck like I was thinking would be natural. It has to be uh, somewhat less curved than that just for inflation to get started. And when you take that into account, you get a somewhat smaller number here. But uh, that's not, I think, so I, in my notes I have that. You get about 65. So that's, uh, sorry, that's flatness. And for the right. Oh, in order, uh, let's see. That is a detailed question which uh, people argue about who do numerical relativity simulations. Uh, that 
is con a matter of controversy. So some people like to say that inflation doesn't really solve the problem because you still needed some fine tuning. Uh, but uh, other people say, well, not really. You just need an accidentally you know, somewhat homogeneous uh, place for, for it to get started. And then it takes over. Uh, you have, so. You're saying you need less if you have positive privilege. Uh, then I, maybe it's not so important because uh, uh, then you'll still get expansion. But again, I think you would have to, in that case, then you would also worry, well, is the expansion then highly anisotropic? And do you ever really get a nice smooth patch that's uh, blowing up homogeneously? Um, so there is debate in the literature about this. I think uh, there is more consensus that it's not Ter terribly uh, worrisome problem. But people uh, like Paul Steinhardt, who uh, push for alternatives to inflation, uh, often um, you know, push on this as one of the weaknesses of inflation. The other question I have is that normally when you see things, they're talking about the num minimum number, number of people to inflation that you've got for the various models. The standard number is 46 to 60. And that seems to be from reheating temperature. Yeah, I'll talk about how so it depends on reheating. This is so much higher than that 46 to 60. It's, it's interesting to me. Does that mean that this overrules that? This um, well, let's see. So I, in my example here, I took 10 to the minus 3 and Planck. Uh, I think is the uh, initial scale. And then I got 65. Uh, 65 is not very far from the canonical maximal okay. value. For the horizon problem, it's useful to uh, think about a picture. I guess there's no pointer. Or s oh, there is a stick here. Um, and this is a picture that uh, basically appears in Colbin and Turner. And what it's showing you is how scales in the universe are, uh, are increasing as a function of time or uh, parameterized by the logarithm of the scale factor. And what these green dotted lines are showing are some typical scales, which are just uh, uh, length scales uh, that are expanding linearly with the, the expansion. Uh, so some, some co-moving scale that's getting stretched by the expansion. So this one is showing, this is the size of the observable universe today. And you know, it's just shrinking uh, proportionally to A as you go back in time. And similarly, this is, this is the horizon size at recombination. That was the size of the little circles in my picture. This is the size of a, a galaxy. And what we want to compare that to, to talk about these questions of causality, whether a region was ever in causal contact, is the, uh, this particle horizon, uh, which is of order the inverse uh, Hubble parameter. And so that's the red line. It's showing how the inverse Hubble parameter is evolving as a function of time. And during inflation, the Hubble parameter was fairly constant. Uh, so it's just flat. But then inflation ends, and we get into Big Bang cosmology, where uh, the scale factor, or, or sorry, the Hubble parameter is going down like uh, 1 over time, which is you know, some power of, uh, so a is t to the 1 half, so t is. Uh, a squared, etc. Uh, and so what we're interested in is, say, the size of this, this little circle. Uh, so in standard Big Bang cosmology, where this line would just keep going forever, we would see that uh, that size was never below uh, the size it would need to be to have been in causal contact. That's the red line. But the good thing about inflation is that it cuts this off. So that now these can meet, and now you can say, oh, there was a time in the past when that region uh, was below 
the horizon, and therefore it had time to uh, come into uh, everything within it to uh, be equilibrated. And so uh, that tells us that as long as inflation lasted long enough, namely uh, where these two uh, lines intersect, then uh, we've solved the horizon problem. And so then one can just do a calculation uh, to figure out uh, how long does that need to, uh, let's see, how long does that need to be? Sorry, I have, uh, I have this one. Uh, now I've confused myself again. Uh, I think I've, I think I may have drawn this wrong. Um. Oh, I'm sorry. Uh, no, no, yeah. I, I was saying the wrong thing. Yeah, we we already knew. We already knew that those things had been uh, in causal contact. Those were the, the things that were supposed to be uniform within themselves. What we wanted was for a much bigger region to be in causal contact. That is the region containing those 10 to the 5 circles. That's this one. So this is uh, the observable universe today scaled back uh, to earlier times. So that's why we want uh, the intersection to be here. And now you can just do a little bit of trigonometry uh, to compute how long, you know, if you think about having a, uh, a triangle uh, along here, we can just compute uh, this length versus this length and figure out uh, how much of the bottom length had to be due to inflation in order to... Uh, to get this point to, to be here. So that's a calculation that, if you looked at my notes, is, uh, it's got a typo. So let me do that calculation. And that's saying, delta log lambda over delta log A, uh, that's the slope uh, of the uh, hypotenuse of that triangle. Well, that's just equal to 1 because the scales are growing linearly with A. But now if we look at the two sides, uh, the change in the uh, length scale was uh, the horizon length at uh, recombination down to the inverse scale of inflation. So uh, at recombination, yeah, so we're looking at, at this point going down to here. And then we want to uh, compare to this length. So this part is uh, just the number of E foldings. So that's the minimum number of E foldings of inflation. And the part that's left over is just the logarithm of uh, the scale factor at equality over the uh, over the uh, scale factor at reheating. Uh, yeah, I'm, make, I'm making a little bit of, I'm not distinguishing between equality and recombination here because it's, it's not a huge factor. Anyway, if you look at my notes, you'll see something incorrect. It's saying that this is proportional to, or this is approximately equal to something. What it should say is that if I now solve this equation 
using standard values for the various quantities, I'll find that the number of e-foldings of inflation is going as uh, the logarithm of the uh, lambda i is the scale of inflation. So the energy scale of inflation. And that's just coming from the Hubble parameter during an inflation. And then we get uh, some temperature scales at recomb recombination and reheating. Uh, and that's actually a rough calculation. If you do it more exactly, you get something involving. So taking into account the difference between recombination and equality, it gives you some factors of order, order one. Uh, and then this should be t equality over t reheating. But numerically, they're approximately the same. And so now we see what you were mentioning, the fact that uh, there is some uncertainty in this number. How much inflation do you need uh, depending on uh, temperature reheating, except now this, is, this seems to be going the wrong way. Uh, I should, for low reheat temperature, I should lead, I should need less, uh, I should need fewer e-foldings of inflation. For, for my estimate, I just assumed efficient reheating, such so that uh, the reheat temperature was of order uh, the uh, scale of inflation. And then, well, how should we do this? <laughs> By the way, when is my nominal finish time? Quarter past. That's accounting for your uh, taking 10 minutes out of my? OK. So I just assumed that uh, the scale of inflation was of the scale of uh, temperature of reheating. And it turns out, we'll see, the maximum value you can use is around 10 to the 16 GeV. And the temperature of recombination is uh, 0.1 EV. So then from this, you find that you need about 60 orders of, or you, you need 60 uh, E-foldings to solve the flatness problem. Uh, so it's interesting that that's a similar number to the one that we wanted for solving uh, the, uh, the horizon problem. Uh, this is this is the maximum. We'll see uh, the maximum value that's consistent with uh, uh, observations, and this this maximum value is going to come from uh, the effect of gravity waves in in the CMB. We'll come to that. So uh, those were the problems that uh, people wanted to solve. But it was also soon realized around 82 and 83 by uh, Hawking, Sturbinsky, Guth and P, Bardeen, Steinhardt, and Turner. And uh, incidentally, that Bardeen, Steinhardt, Turner paper, I think that's the one from that era that's still uh, really worth reading, that inflation solved one more really big problem. And that was the origin of density perturbations. And this is something that uh, you know, people had been worrying about because they knew how st structure should form, how galaxies should form uh, approximately, and that you needed a certain level of inhomogeneities in the universe, in fact, of order of part in 10 to the fourth, uh, in order to explain uh, the observed universe. So what we will see in the next lecture 
is that uh, there are quantum fluctuations of the of the inflaton which are uh, usually expressed in Fourier space. So let's take the Fourier transform of the uh, space fluctuation in real space. And what we will see is that when the universe is expanding uh, exponentially, one gets fluctuations which are uh, dictated by the Hubble parameter. And so that's the size of them. And the other important feature of these is that, uh, so this is uh, a scale dependent quantity. Uh, K is telling you the, uh, it's the wave number corresponding to the wavelength of that fluctuation. On this side of the equation, we don't see any explicit K dependence. And H is roughly constant during inflation. So this leads to what is known as almost scale invariant uh, perturbations. And that is also consistent with observations. So, uh, you know, a great um, kind of uh, victory or a, you know, indication that we're on the right track with inflation. Uh, so when would you like me to stop uh, for coffee? Okay. We have 75 minute lectures. Mm -hmm. Okay. Okay, so I'll try to get through a little bit, just a little bit more then. So now let me just try to give a picture of how these inflaton fluctuations give rise to uh, observable. Uh, so for instance, the temperature variation in the microwave, microwave background. And uh, here's a picture of the potential again illustrating that uh, you could imagine that different regions of the universe would have somewhat different values of the, the scalar field. And so it means that uh, when uh, reheating happens uh, for, you know, when one of these regions reaches the bottom of the potential and inflation is over, uh, the other one is still continuing to inflate a little bit. And one of the consequences is that uh, the spatial curvature uh, in those regions is going to be a little bit different. One's going to get blown up a little bit more than the other. And so, uh, so we're interested in uh, the fluctuations of the spatial curvature, which is uh, denoted by this script R at a given scale. So those will be uh, given by variations in 1 over uh, a squared. So we would like to know how much more the universe inflated uh, in one region than in another. Well, of course, a is going like e to the ht. So this uh, turns out to be h delta t, where delta t is the time difference uh, between uh, inflation in those two patches. And the time difference, that's just uh, governed by uh, the, the difference in field versus uh, how fast it's rolling. And so we can, and we already estimated that this is of uh, order h. So now we can plug in here and we can see that this is going like h squared over uh, phi dot. So now we have a prediction for uh, how much the curvature is changing. And uh, an interesting thing about this is, yes, it's, it's almost scale invariant because these quantities are changing slowly uh, during inflation. 
but it's not exactly. Uh, and uh, the evolution of these quantities during inflation will give rise to uh, a weak violation of the scale invariance, which is something that can be observed. Uh, and how do you observe it? Uh, well, so this is, I can't write too far down on this uh, board. So the observable, uh, or something that's close, closer related to an observable quantity is the uh, power spectrum of this curvature fluctuation. It's known as the, uh, the scalar uh, power spectrum. It's is related to the, the scalar infl infliton. So it's the Fourier transform of the correlation function in real space of curvature at, uh, at different points. And you can e easily work out that, so this is what we call P, P sub S. You can easily work out that uh, this is just the, the Fourier coefficient uh, or Fourier amplitude that I denoted before uh, squared. And so this is going as h to the fourth over phi dot squared. And by definition, people, can I still write here? People like to parameterize this as, a, uh, as an overall normalization, A, and a power law to denote the weak dependence, uh, the weak dependence on a scale that we're going to, to derive. Uh, doesn't look weak, but by, uh, so this is just a convention. NS equals one means scale invariant. And so what we'll see is that uh, from slow roll inflation, we get a value of NS which is, is close to one. And the small deviations are going to show up in uh, the microwave background fluctuations that are shown here. So this is the first observation of uh, the microwave background fluctuations by the COBE uh, experiment in uh, 1992. And this is showing uh, this is showing the correlations of temperature in in real space. I'll just take three more minutes if that's okay. Um, so this is looking at uh, the correlation function of the relative fluctuations in temperature uh, between different points in space. But since we're looking on the sky, uh, this is in terms of angles instead of uh, three-dimensional space. And uh, so this picture, it confirms an amplitude uh, of order 10 to the minus 4 that people already knew you needed in order to explain galaxy formation. Uh, so the size of that uh, was, was no surprise. And, uh, well, so these fluctuations are uh, related to acoustic peaks. And uh, they're more easily visualized in, uh, in spherical harmonic space. If we expand the temperature fluctuations on the, on the sky in terms of spherical harmonics, um, and then one can measure these coefficients ALM and define coefficients CL, which are uh, averaging over the magnetic uh, numbers. So for each ALM, you average over the, L, over the M. And now plot these CLs as a function 
of L. Then you get a much prettier picture, also having oscillations. And uh, these are the famous uh, Doppler peaks or acoustic peaks. So um, I want to tell you uh, what's the origin of those, uh, those peaks. Uh, but the main point for what we're talking about in terms of the scale, uh, the, the scale dependence of the, uh, the power spectrum is that, well, it affects the details of, the, uh, uh, of these peaks. And so one can get a rather good measurement of n sub s, this power uh, spectral index of 0.968 plus or minus 0 0.006. And this is from uh, the Planck 2015 uh, inflation paper 1502-02114. Uh, so I'll have to fill in more details in the, uh, the next lecture. But uh, I'll stop here and just take some questions if you... Yeah, it's a very heuristic picture. You shouldn't take it too literally. Well, that was in the original picture, but now uh, we don't need the tunneling at all. We can just imagine that we started somewhere on the potential, and whatever happened before that's irrelevant. I have two questions related to the scale of power spectrum. So just in terms of terminology, is that the same as the curvature power spectrum, or are those two different things? Yes, uh, that's the curvature uh, power spectrum. Uh, and then uh, we'll, we'll mention that the, the power spectrum for the density perturbation is uh, related by some powers of k. Okay, yeah. So the other thing I was going to ask is, so I mean, really what you're observing is something more like the temperature correlations. And then you relate that to scale factor and that in turn to curvature? Well, there's a, a complicated story that I'm leaving out of how to, uh, where did I put the, um, yeah. How do you relate, relate, relate this to the temperature perturbations? Because there's a lot of complicated evolution that goes on. You need to compute a transfer function. You need to do evolution. Uh, you need to solve Boltzmann equations. Uh, and uh, so, you know, it's a, uh, well, I, I guess it's, it's a linear relation, but it's a complicated uh, functional relation that's uh, relating those two things. And for those details, the, uh, the book by Little and Life is a very good uh, place. Okay, I guess we can have coffee then. Oh, there was another...